the world and there's nothing worse than going to some place that has horrible worship. And I've been to places where it sounded like two cats fighting on a tin roof and they call that worship. I've been to places where seven or eight people on the platform, all of them singing and not one of them can carry a tune in a bucket. It sounded like they were all singing different songs at the same time. So thank God for good worship. Amen? God is wonderful. Hallelujah. Amen. My name is Ricky Leonard. I'm an evangelist. I currently live in Wilmington, North Carolina. If you don't know where that is, uh, it's about 520 miles south of here on the coast, southeast coast of North Carolina, just about an hour north of Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. And uh, it was a move of God to get me here in the snow because I don't like cold weather. Uh, I've been, two of my meetings have been canceled because of ice already in the last week. And I don't like cold weather. I was at the beach just in, enjoying myself and they're having 75 degree weather and I'm here. But it's, uh, it's a God thing, amen? It's a God thing and it's going to keep going, amen. Amen. Uh, I've been in ministry now for 33 years, and I've preached in about 35, 36 countries. Some of those countries I've been into a dozen times or more, and people always ask me, and it's good that you touched on it, Brother Mike, people always ask me, well, how do you get the money to do all that stuff, God? You see, let me give you a secret. God will fund his vision for you. But what you have to do is spend time in prayer seeking him and going after him with your whole heart to find out what he has for you to do. Once you find out what he has for you to do, then all you need to do is take one step of faith in that direction. As you begin to go by faith, God meets you and provides for you. When God called me in 1981 to preach the gospel around the world, I said, all right, let's go. And then later I thought about that. I should have asked a few questions. How do you do that? I've never been around anything. I've been around Florida. That's the only place I was around. I grew up in Florida. I didn't know anything. I didn't know how to travel anywhere. I didn't know about expenses, about raising money. I didn't know any of that. I just began to go, and as I began to go, God began to provide. And he still provides today. Sometimes I'll be in prayer and he'll say, I want you to go to uh, Ghana, I want you to go to Mozambique, and I want you to go to Congo, and I want you to do four crusades in those three countries, and you're going to do that in July. I said, huh? It's already March and you want me to do that in July? I said, okay, Lord, I'm willing to go. You send the money. And somehow it comes. It just comes. Weird things happen. One time I was going to preach, uh, do a big uh, open air crusade in Africa in the jungle. We, preach, we don't preach in big cities. We go to rural places. We go to places where other people fear to go. And I was going to do this rural crusade. And the Lord just put in my heart one day to go to a fellowship of Christian athletes luncheon meeting. Now, I've been there a couple of times before. I think they're doing a great work. They have a great ministry, reaching youth for the Jesus. And uh, I went to this luncheon meeting, and I know a couple of the businessmen there. And one of the guys, I sat right down. As soon as I sat down before the meeting, this man across the table, he said, Hey, aren't you going to Africa pretty soon? I said, Yeah. He said, How much does that trip cost? And I told him. He didn't even bat an eye. He said, Can you come out to my car for just a minute? I said, Sure. Walked out to the man's car. He opened his door. He pulled out one of these big business checkbooks opened it up, and he wrote a check for the whole thing. You see, a lot of times we think it's our idea to go to that lunch. It was God's idea for me to go. It was God's idea for that man to come that day. And then he put us together, and then God touched his heart to just write a check for the whole thing. That happens to me frequently. I've been to churches preaching, and I never, you can ask Brother Mike this, I have never asked for an offering. I have never demanded anything. I don't tell them you have to provide this, you have to provide that. I just come. If God tells me to go, I go. And I preached at a church one time, a big church. And when I finished preaching at that church, they gave me an offering equal to about $75. 
I didn't say anything. I didn't get angry. Mike, you've probably been to the same church. I didn't get angry about it. I just packed up my stuff, and I started walking out the door. And as I'm going out the door, an old lady stopped me at the back of the door. She said, young man, wait just a moment. And she's digging around her purse. She said, the Lord told me to give you this check. It was 50 times what the church gave. I'm always blessed. You know why I'm blessed? Because I say that I'm blessed. I speak blessings out of my mouth. If you want to be blessed, you have to stop talking about how poor you are. Stop talking about what you don't have. Stop talking about what you can't do because you're shutting down the power of God. Just shut your mouth. If you can't say anything good, don't say anything. Just open up the Bible and say, I agree with the word. If you can do that, you're better off than saying a bunch of garbage. I'll tell you what, I can lead you to people today that have not had education. In fact, let me say this. Out of the Fortune 500 companies around the world, these are the top 500 companies of the world, 30% of the CEOs never went to college or graduated college. You don't have to be a genius to have an awesome idea. God will give you the idea. You don't have to be highly educated to be blessed. I've met some very wealthy, ignorant people. I mean, ignorant in mannerisms and things. Dumb hicks. But God has blessed them with a lot of dough. He can do the same thing for you. Real quick, before I get cranked up here too much, Brother Mike said, I got CDs back there. You see where that blue board is back there with the camera stand? Right behind that, on that right-hand corner of the table, Brother Mike's giving me about three foot there. I've got four CDs. Real quick, I'm going to say this. I love you, brother. This green CD is called The Most Powerful Source in the Universe, Your Words. By your words, you'll be justified, and by your words, you'll be condemned. Out of your own mouth, blessings come and cursings come. And most of the time, we're speaking cursings, not blessings. We're complaining. We're whining about the weather. We're whining about the economy. We don't like Obama. We didn't like the guy that came before Obama. And we probably won't like the person that comes after Obama. Listen, I don't get into politics. I let Jesus take care of that. The Bible said Jesus put those in authority, and he takes those out of authority. That's all I need to do. I pray, I do my part, and, I, and I, I cast my vote, and I leave it there, and that's it. Other than that, I don't worry about it. Jesus takes care of it. But your words are powerful. Jesus created the whole world by speaking words. He said, let there be light, and there was light. Let there be land, and there was land. We have got to realize that we have the same power and authority that Jesus Christ had, and we need to begin using it. If you don't like your neighborhood, change it. Start speaking words that change your neighborhood. Start praying for ideas that will change your neighborhood. If you don't like the economy, start speaking words that will change the economy. Tell me, I don't hurt for anything. I don't want for anything. Brother Mike said he's been in health for how many years now, Mike? 40 years. I'm 62 years old right now. I'll be 63 in October. I don't get sick. I haven't been sick, and I never intend to get sick again. You know, when cold, feet, cold season comes around, hay fever season, flu season, I don't participate. I've opted out. I just don't participate. I just don't get sick. Am I superhuman? I don't even eat well. I'm a meat and potato guy. I don't do green things. I don't like green vegetables. I don't care for them at all. I don't eat broccoli. I don't eat spinach. I don't eat any of that weirdo stuff. Just meat and potatoes, you know. I eat a piece of celery every now and then. I'll eat a couple of lettuce leaves every now and then. That's about as green as I get. I love beans. But I speak the word. You see, if you speak the word, the word is more powerful than what you eat. Now, I believe in eating right. Don't get me wrong. You can't sit around every night and eat a half a gallon of ice cream and wonder why you're fat. You know, that's just, that's just dumb. You know, if all you eat is junk food, you're going to be sick. I'll tell you that right now. You've got to balance it out. I balance out the junk with the mashed potatoes and, and, and the beef. You know, I balance it out. I don't just eat beef all the time. Once in a while, I eat chicken. So your words are powerful. Number two, faith released. 
This is a new CD I have called Releasing Your Faith. God has given to every man, Romans 12, 3, the measure of faith. He's dealt or given to every man the measure of faith. But you've got to do something with it. You can have all the faith in the world inside of you, but if you never let it out, nothing's going to happen. This is an awesome CD for that. The next one is called Racing with the Wind. This is a CD of my testimony. I gave it a full gospel businessmen's world convention in Anaheim, California, many years ago. And uh, it's a powerful testimony. If you haven't heard my testimony, I was basically raised on a circus, became demon-possessed. I was a hippie. I know it's hard to believe today. I was a long-haired, freaky boy. I have blonde hair about down to here. I used to braid beads and bells in my hair, little leather twisty ties. I had a top hat with stars and stripes. I had filthy, nasty blue jeans that never got washed, and I was an accident waiting to happen somewhere. I was a dope being a dope, hanging around other dopes being dopey. I mean, that's just what I did, you know. From that, I transitioned into being demon-possessed. Then I got in a shootout with the police. A policeman shot me in the back of the head, which messed up my whole day. I got shot in the back of the head with a 38 hollow point and was dead on arrival at the hospital. So from that, I got saved. I got sent off to prison, got saved, got filled with the Holy Ghost. Four and a half years later, after being paralyzed, brain damage, epileptic seizures every day for four and a half years, loss of motor skills, balance, judgment of distance, a total physical wreck. Four and a half years later, I prayed a simple prayer of faith and threw my crutches to the ground and ran out the door, totally healed. My right leg grew out two inches. It was short, shrunk up from not being used for four and a half years. God totally healed me. I have not had those, any of those problems since that time. I don't take any medications. I don't even take vitamins. I've tried to, but I just can't get in the habit of it, you know. I don't see the reason for it. I'm not sick. I don't get sick, so why do I need vitamins? Somebody told me I'm getting old. Well, old, I think, is a state of mind. You know, you can be old if you want to. The Bible said Moses was 80 years old and his eyes weren't dim and he had the strength of a 40-year-old man. I'll take that promise. Amen? I'm not 80 years old yet. Praise God. My testimony. And the last one is called spiritual authority. Most Christians have no idea what kind of authority and what kind of power we have. Jesus said, all authority is given to me in heaven and in earth. And he told the disciples, go therefore. In other words, he transferred that authority to them. Did you know that the disciples ministered with Jesus for three and a half years while Jesus was on this earth and they weren't even saved? Did you know that? They were heathens, as we say in the South. They weren't saved. In John 20, 22, the Bible said Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Ghost. Except the Holy Ghost draw you, the Bible says, you can't be saved. They didn't have the Holy Ghost. They were operating only under the authority of Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, they cast out demons. In Jesus' name, they healed the sick. In Jesus' name, they raised the dead. In Jesus' name, whole cities got saved. How much greater now that they finally got saved and then in Acts chapter 2 they got filled with the Holy Ghost and power. How much more did they change the world then? You see, they were just mere men operating under the power and authority of Jesus' name. There's power in that name. There's not power in any other name in the world. You know, a lady came up to Brother Shambach one time, Pastor Shambach, she said, Brother Shambach, I'm a Muslim. Will you pray for my healing in the name of Allah? He said, by sure, honey, I'll be glad to. He prayed for her. And he said, how do you feel? She said, I'm still sick. He said, well, we better pray in the name of Jesus then. They prayed in the name of Jesus, and she was completely healed. You see, there's no power in Allah. There's no power in Buddha. There's no power in Confucius. There's power in Jesus' name only, and that's it. There is power in that name. I got released from prison in March of 1981. And the last thing God spoke to me one week before I got out of prison, he said, I want you to go around the world and preach the gospel. I said, all right, let's go. Now, I had no training, no skills, never went to Bible college. While I was in prison, Brother Kenneth Hagin 
sent me all the books and tapes and tracts and everything that Kenneth Hagin Ministries had, enrolled me in Rhema Bible College correspondence. And I took about a year and two months of that before they kicked me out of prison. And when I got out of prison, I was so busy preaching the gospel, I've never finished that course. I preached for many, many years. I was ordained with a ministry in North Carolina called Britain Ministries. Ralph and Hilda Britton were sort of like Charles and Francis Hunter's ministry. They operated in prophetic gift and ministered and saw miracles happen. Awesome people of God. Ralph went home to be with the Lord a few years ago. Hilda's still around. She's 87, still preaching the gospel. She's an awesome woman of God. So I was going out and ministering for about 10 or 12 years, and I get a call one day from a school called Christ for the Nations Bible College in Dallas, Texas. If you ever heard of a man... Uh, the man that started that, Dr. Gordon Lindsay. Gordon Lindsay was a contemporary of Oral Roberts and all those 40s and 50s tent preachers. He had a huge healing ministry tent back in the late 40s and did powerful ministry and also wrote about 90 books. Mike, you got a ways to go to catch up. He wrote some tremendous books on miracles of things. And if you'll read some of his books, you'll see what people have copied today. I don't have a problem with people copying it because things need to be translated into the next generation. You know, Disney's caught on to that, right? They re-release all these Cinderella movies and all these different movies about every eight or ten years. They re-release them made brand new. Why? Because there's a new generation of kids coming up. I don't have a problem re-releasing teachings of the gospel or books, rewriting books that have been written and out of print now, rewriting them so that the next generation can enjoy them. There's nothing wrong with that. Hallelujah. So I get a call from Christ for the Nations, and they said, we have noticed your ministry. We've been watching you. And even though you never went to school here, we would like you to come in, in December and be ordained with Christ for the Nations and affiliate your ministry with us. So I did. So for many years now, I've been affiliated with Christ for the Nations. If you ever want to go to an awesome Bible college, that is one of them. Nuts and bolts. I mean, they don't get into a lot of philosophical mumbo-jumbo stuff. They don't give you things you don't need. They teach you how to preach the gospel. They teach pastors and worship leaders. They got the most awesome worship. If you go to cfni.org, you can download their worship music or get their CD for free. It is awesome. They, they, and every year they put out a brand new album. The students and a worship leader put out a new album. Fantastic music. They have churches in 160 countries around the world. That's just about all the countries there is, I think. Pretty close. One more thing real quick. I have a track back there called the Baptism, uh, the Baptism in the Holy Spirit. A lot of people are confused on this. They've come from denominational backgrounds. And uh, if you've been raised, for instance, Baptist, the Baptists believe that once you get born again, you've got all you're going to get. I mean, that's it. You've got the Holy Spirit, everything. But there's a problem with that. In Acts chapter 19, verse 1 through 6, the Bible said the apostle Paul came, aso came upon some believers. What is a believer? A Christian. We would call that a Christian today, right? Came upon some believers, and he asked them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said to him, We have not even heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. They didn't know anything about it. Now, they were believers. They were Christians. They were born again. But they didn't know anything about the Holy Ghost. Did they receive the Holy Ghost when they were born again? I believe that every person receives a measure. The Holy Ghost will draw you. But then it says, Paul laid his hands on them and said, Receive the Holy Ghost. And the Bible says, They spoke in tongues and prophesied. They were filled with the Spirit. It radically changed their life, added two new gifts to their ministry, and God sent them out. If you'll notice in the book of Acts, there are five places where it talks about being filled with the Spirit, starting in Acts chapter 2. And out of those five places, the Bible says in three of those places that they spoke in tongues when they were filled with the Spirit. Now, Paul, who used to be Saul when he was persecuting Christians, the Bible says he was struck blind by God and they led him into a house on Straight Street. And God spoke to a prophet called Ananias and said, Go to this Saul on Straight Street, for he is a called and chosen vessel of me. 
I want you to lay your hands on him that he might be healed and be filled with the Holy Ghost. So he was healed, his scales fell from his eyes, he could see again, and he was filled with the Holy Ghost. But it did not say he prayed in tongues. But if you go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, when Paul was teaching the church about baptism in the Holy Spirit and about operating gifts of tongues and, and interpretation in the church body, Paul said, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than all of you. Actually, what he said, he said it in the southern version. I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. That's what he said in the King Jimmy version. The other place, there was a sorcerer following the apostles around. And he saw the gift of the Holy Ghost being poured out on people when they prayed for them. They received the gift of the Holy Ghost. So obviously there's a difference between having it and not having it. And when he saw this gift being poured out on them, the Bible says he offered them money to buy the gift. And they said, your money be cursed with you. You can't buy the gift of God. And then the man repented when he realized what he did. He said, I'm sorry, forgive me, but I want this gift of the Holy Ghost. So in all five places, they spoke in tongues. So if you're filled with the Holy Ghost, you need to speak in tongues. What's the purpose of speaking in tongues? Well, number one, you saw it tonight. Prophecy and interpretation. Kathy spoke in tongues gave a message in tongues. She got a message directly from God, spoke it to us, and her husband got the interpretation. That's a gift of prophecy, the two together, and it edifies or builds up the church. It encourages people. But you could have a personal gift of tongues, which is a prayer language. How many of you ever come in a serious situation and you run out of words to pray? You just don't know what to say. I mean, Somebody's in a hospital, they just got in a bad wreck, or they had a heart attack, or their baby just got killed, got hit by a car, and you're just at a loss for words. I mean, you go to the parents, and they're grieving, and you want to say something, but it all sounds like so much mumbo-jumbo, you know, like, they don't need to hear this from me right now. I don't even know how to pray for this mother. I don't know how to pray for this family. Pray in tongues. Because when you pray in tongues, the Bible says, your mind is unfruitful, but your spirit prays, the Holy Spirit of God that lives in your spirit is praying through you the perfect will of God to heaven. Do we know the perfect will of God? No. From time to time, he reveals bits and pieces of it to us, but that's it. So how do I know if I'm praying for you, brother, how do I know what the perfect will of God is for you tonight? I don't. But if I pray in tongues, God will let me know. And, and he'll... He'll intercede for you through me. I'll be your intercessor. I'll be your go-between. I'll be your stand-in between you and God. And God will take care of it. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it gives you a greater understanding of the Word of God, a greater insight into the Word of God. If you're not filled with the Spirit, you'll read the Bible and you'll be confused. If you're not filled with the Spirit, you'll read the Bible and very seldom will you ever get any great revelation out of it. It's like reading a book. And it's difficult to read sometimes. Some of you missed that anointing. I just spit and you missed the anointing. If you were here in the front row, you would have gotten it. I believe that. We need this gift of the Holy Spirit. Jesus never went into ministry until he was filled with the Holy Spirit. John never went into ministry until he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul never went into ministry until he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Because when he was healed on Straight Street that day... He went off for two or three years training and got filled with the Spirit, got filled with the power of God, and then came back to minister. The apostles never went into full-time ministry on their own until they were filled with the Spirit. We need to be filled with the Spirit if you want to accomplish something for God. If not, you're going to be working really hard and accomplishing very little, very, very little. I'll tell you what the Spirit of God does. God operates through all of us Christians with different gifts. They're his gifts. He gives us at certain times for certain situations. I was on an airplane coming back from preaching in this horrible place in the Caribbean. Um, you know, 75 degrees year-round and sunny. And I was preaching on this island. And when I got to the airport to get on the plane, the lady said, we have... Uh, 
because you're a frequent flyer and we've got a lot of open seats, we put you in first class. Is that okay? I said, yes, ma'am. I think that'll be fine. They put me in first class. So I knew there was a reason for that. You know, I, I'm not just dumb. I, I'm just not going to enjoy this big seat. I don't drink the cocktail, so who cares? So I sit down next to a businessman. And the guy's got his computer out and his headphones in, and he's doing all kind of stuff. And I started praying in tongues. I said, now, Lord, you have a reason for me to sit next to this man tonight. What do you want me to tell him? It's about three hours to Miami. You just tell me what I need to tell this man. I, I want you to give me an opening, something that's not just a canned opening, something unique. So all, I didn't even think about it. I, the words didn't even come to me. I just turned to the man, and I opened my mouth. Why? Because I expected God to speak through me. And I said to this man, never seen this man in my life, I said, your wife is going to come back to you. I said, you've made a mess of things. You've been a bum, but your wife is going to come back to you. He said, what? what, what, what? Do, do I know you? Do you know my wife? I said, no, I've never seen the lady. I said, but God, he said, who said? I said, God said, your wife is going to come back to you. And he thought about that for a second, and tears welled up in his eyes. He said, you're right. I've made a mess of things, and my wife left me. I don't even know where she's at. I have no idea. And he said, I, I, I'm just amazed that you know that. I said, I don't know it. God told me that. But he told me that so I could minister to you and bring you peace. I said, you need to give your life to Jesus, number one, so that you can pray effectively for your marriage and for your wife. I said, she's coming back to you, but if you do things the way you did before, she'll leave again. Something's got to change. I led that man to Jesus on that plane. He got baptized in the Holy Ghost. And when he got off that plane, he was singing, he was dancing. He was all happy for Jesus. You see, that's what it's all about. That's a gift of the Holy Ghost. I stand in front of people praying for them. And God shows me they have a cancer in their liver. God shows me they have a mass in their chest. God shows me that they have a, a knee that's messed up. And a lot of times, you know, God knows, I have a good sense of humor. So God shows me little cartoon pictures. He showed me that the leg bone connected to the knee bone, and, and like a little child drew a picture. And I, I'm standing in front of a person, and I'm seeing this. And sometimes it's a serious situation, and I start laughing. <laughs> what are you laughing about? I said, well, you won't believe this picture I just saw. God showed me a picture of your knee, and, man, it's all messed up. And it's, it's like, you know, it doesn't, things don't fit together right. But the reason I'm laughing is because God's going to heal it tonight. And he does. We need that power of the Holy Ghost. Also, we put out a newsletter every month. It's got a harvester on there. We're harvesting people around the world. Take a copy of that newsletter. In fact, I'll tell you what. Brother, would you do this for me? Take these and pass them around. Everybody take one. If we don't have enough, there's more on the table. If you'd like to receive that newsletter by mail or email, there's a list back there, a little paper back there. You can sign up. Give us your email and your name. Tell us where you live so we know where it's coming from. Amen? We don't beg people for money. We don't ask for money. God's not broke. I checked his bank account the other day. He's doing pretty good. Amen? And he backs me up, so I ain't worried about it. I'm not worried about it. Hallelujah. Well, that's a prelude. Let me get to my message here. Thank you, Jesus. You know, God is so awesome. So awesome. We have seen in our ministry people, just like uh, Brother Mike said earlier, we have seen people heal of every kind of sickness and disease you can ever imagine. We have seen an eye put in an empty socket that didn't have an eye. We've seen blind eyes open. We saw a woman in South America that had one eye that was all gray. When she was a little girl, she got hit in the eye with a stick, and she was blind in that eye. I traveled four and a half hours by speedboat in the jungle in Guyana, South America, up into the jungle. And when I got out of the boat, this lady met me. She's a helper of the pastor. She's about 55, 60 years old. And she said, Pastor, come here. Grab, quick, let me grab your hand. She grabbed my hand and she put it on her eye. She said, before you leave here, I'm going to see out of this eye, her gray eye. So that afternoon, they put me on another boat. I went out to a village to a logging camp to preach out in the jungle. She got on another boat, her and another lady, and went out to do a Sunday school teaching in a village up the different river. So the next day, she came up to me, and she said, 
Look at, I can see out of my eye. She covered her good eye, and she could see out of that gray eye. Now, that's impossible, but she could see. The following day, I was only there for three days on that trip. The following day, she came up to me, and she said, tell me which eye is messed up. And I looked, and both of her eyes were exactly the same. Sometimes miracles happen instantly. Just set them down there. Sometimes miracles happen instantly. Sometimes it's a slow release process. Why? I don't know. God does what he wants to do. We've had three people confirm cases of full-blown AIDS. People had skin and bones. They, they looked like a skeleton. Two lady, two girls in Nigeria, two teenage girls, their parents died of AIDS. The village threw them out of the village. They wandered out in the jungle for weeks, didn't have a place to go. Everybody was afraid of them. Finally, they came to a village that accepted them. They wouldn't touch them, but they brought them food, and they brought them clothes, and they took care of these two girls. I came to that village, the first white man they'd ever seen. I came to that village pouring down rain on a July night. We did a two-night crusade, and I prayed for people. People were standing in knee-deep water, listening to me preach in the pitch black, no lights. We had one light bulb over my head while I was preaching and a piece of tin to protect, keep the rain off of me and the, and the sound system we had, and, we, and that was it. People were standing out in the rain, and it looked like about 30, 40 people out there. I couldn't see very far. It was so dark. And I said, now, when, while I'm preaching, Jesus is going to heal people. When you get healed, your pain leaves, your sickness leaves. I want you to just wave your hand so that we know Jesus is in the house. Jesus is healing people. So as I'm preaching, hands are waving all out in the dark. So afterwards, I said, now, listen, if you're here and you're still sick, you need prayer, come up here right now. I'm going to lay hands on you. 250 people came out of the dark. I mean, it was hundreds of people standing out in the rain. Here in the United States, people don't come to church if it's cold. They don't come if it's foggy. They don't come if they don't feel good. They don't come if somebody told them it's going to rain. I mean, just the least little excuse, people don't come to church. And then they stay home. Where's your mother at? Well, she's home. She's sick. Well, why didn't you bring her to church? That's where you get healed. You don't get healed laying at home in bed feeling sorry for yourself. So these people came up, and I started laying hands in there. It was getting late. They have robbers on the road there that will pull you over, kill you, cut your head off with a machete. So we decided we wanted to get out of there by a certain time, and it was about that time. So I just started laying hands on these people. I mean, I was slapping them in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Some of them were falling down, sliding in the mud like this. I mean, it looked like, looked like a ski slope. You know, they were just falling down. The water was splashing all over people. Some people were just standing there shaking. I prayed for all these people, and we packed up our stuff, and I said, now, tomorrow night, I'll be back here. And I said, some of you, as you leave this place tonight, your miracle will manifest. Some of you will go to sleep tonight, and you'll wake up in the morning, and your miracle will be manifested. You'll, you'll be healed. You'll, you'll just have a tremendous miracle. Some of you will be coming to the meeting tomorrow night, and as you're on the way, your miracle will manifest. So I said, tomorrow night, before I even preach, we're going to take testimony. So the next night we got there. Now, our worship team was awesome. We had one guy with a broken bongo drum. One of the skins was cut on it, was broken on it. So he was going, pop, 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 pop. And they had a guy with a bass guitar with two rusty strings and a little amplifier about this big. And this guy's going, pop, 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 pop. And he's going, boop, 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 boop. That was their worship team. And the people were dancing. I'm telling you, African people will dance with anything. They were dancing and having a good time. And I said, all right, now who's got a testimony for Jesus? I said, last night, we're going to have a testimony service tonight. If Jesus did a miracle for you between last night and right now, come up here. And so these two girls come up, teenage girls, and they look fine. I mean, nothing, they didn't look like anything wrong with them. And the one girl said, we were here last night, and we're dying of AIDS. And I'm looking at this girl. She looks fine. She said, my friend and I were from another village, and they threw us out of the village, and our parents died. And so we came to this village, and they're taking care of us. And last night, we were here, and people were waving their hands that they were healed, and we weren't healed. And then we came up for prayer afterwards, and she said, you hit me on the side of the head so hard, my head was ringing all night. Just, you were just slapping people. And yet, she said, you pushed my friend, and people had to catch her because she was so weak. And she said, when it was all finished, we were still sick. And we had to lock arms and, and walk down through the pitch black and the rain last night back to the little hut where we sleep at 
and we lay down and went to sleep. We were exhausted. She said, this morning we got up, the sun was shining, and I looked at my friend and I said, hey, uh, you, you look different. She said, I feel great today. How do you feel? She said, I feel wonderful. They walked out into the sunshine, and overnight AIDS had disappeared, and they had each gained about 10 pounds of flesh on their body. Their skin color came back. They were black ladies, but they had ashen skin. It was, it was horrible looking, the, the, the toll that AIDS took on those girls. But they were completely healed. And it was at this point in the testimony, the villagers even re recognized who this girl was. She had changed so much in 24 hours. They went berserk. Man, we danced for three or four hours that night. I didn't preach at all. We just danced, and we'd stop and take testimonies, and we'd dance some more, and praise God some more. The guy with that bass guitar, boop, boop. Boop, boop. We were rocking out, man. It was awesome. We have seen God just do so many awesome things. And, you know, God gives us favor. When I go to other countries to preach, one of the first things we do is we go right to the government officials' offices, to the mayor, to the head of the military, to the local chief of police. We go to their office and say, hey, I'm a man of God. I want to pray for you. Can I pray for you right now? Uh, well, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, Muslim countries, Buddhist countries, Hindus, they, they want to give you respect, so they say, okay, sure. If you want to pray for me, you know, no problem. We had such favor. When I go to pay, pray for these people, the power of God hits them. Sometimes they get knocked down on the floor. Sometimes they start crying, you know, and, and they're getting their uniform all messed up. And uh, they start blabbering, and they say, oh, you need to pray for my wife, too. Pray for my wife. Pray for my children. Sometimes we're there for a half hour praying for their cousins, their nephews, their neighbors, the guy in the office next door. I mean, it, they just go, once they feel the power of God, they want you to pray for everybody. And then they take out their business card and hand it to me, and they said, listen, while you're in our country, if you ever have any problem, just call us, and we'll take care of it. God gives us favor. We do crusades in Muslim areas, and we have Muslims helping us do the crusade. We had people lined up in our prayer line, and this one Muslim man, a great big brother, he got up there and he said, I'm going to help keep these people in line. Get over there. Get over there. Get over there. You want to get your miracle, you've got to stay in line. Don't, don't you try to jump. He was pushing them over there. And on the other side, we had two police officers with machine guns shoving them. Get, get in that line. Get it. It was awesome. We were running them through like cattle. We were just coming fast as they come by. We'd touch them. It was awesome. Great testimonies happened out of that. But you know, miracles are wonderful, but there are things that will stop your healing. Did you know that? The Bible says unforgiveness is the number one reason. If you'll search it out, unforgiveness is the number one reason people don't get healed. The Bible says that if you don't forgive, in, in Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, if you don't forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you. If you don't forgive, it also says your father cannot forgive you. That's pretty powerful. Now, I've run across a lot of serious situations. Girls that have been molested, people that have been beaten up, kids that have been locked in closets for 10 years, and then they finally got out. Somebody finally sprung them and let them free. You know, they've got a reason to hate people, don't they? And you've got a reason to hate people. But I'll tell you what, if you want to be healed, you better stop hating. If you want to be healed, you better forgive and let that go. Yes, it was horrible. Yes, it was unjust. Yes, those persons probably should rot in hell for that. But that's up to God, not you. So don't you judge them and hold them accountable for that. You release it. If you want to live healthy and happy and have an awesome life and hear from God on a regular basis, you have to forgive. There's a lot of people I've had to forgive in my life that I did not want to forgive. That did not deserve forgiveness. But I had to finally release it and let it go. I don't want God to, to stop working in my life. I want to be able to hear his voice. If you have hatred, if you have anger, if you have fear, it will stop your healing. If you have resentment, there are so many things that will stop your healing. We have a seminar that we teach. It's a two-day healing seminar it's about eight hours total, and we have a question and answer session, but we cover 18 different topics, why people are not healed. You know, a lot of times, I get so tired of hearing this, people come to a church, and, and, and they've heard a lot about me, about miracles happening through me, 
and they'll come up and, and they'll get prayed for and then they get mad because I didn't heal them. Well, I'll tell you something right now. I can't heal anybody. It's God that works through me that heals people. I'm just a glorified garden hose. You know, a hose, does a hose get glory? A hose is just a hose. It's something that the Holy Ghost flows through. Now, I've noticed something about hoses. If you leave a hose out in the yard through the winter or all season and you don't do anything with that hose, you don't turn the hose on, dirt and, and stuff tends to get clogged up in that hose. Our job as a Christian is to keep that hose clean, to, God, to repent on a regular basis, to ask God to search us and cleanse us, to forgive, to release junk that's in our lives, to love people, to walk in, in hope and love and faith. And if we do our job, then that keeps our hose clean. Now the Holy Spirit can flow through us and minister to other people. If sometimes you have a hit in ministry, sometimes you pray for people and things happen and sometimes they don't, maybe you need to clean up some more of your hose. You need to get some more junk out of your life. You know, the whole Christian life is a series of deliverances. We're being delivered from ourselves. I first had to be delivered from demons, but then when I got rid of the demons, I had religious teaching. I had a bunch of junk in my life. I had all sorts of uh, wrong programming, wrong information that I'd been taught through my whole life. And I had to, little by little, as God put his finger on it, I had to get rid of it. Now, when God puts his finger on your sin of today, you have a choice to make. Am I going to get rid of it or am I going to hang on to it? You know, like I said earlier, if somebody has done something seriously wrong to you, cheated you, robbed you, molested you, you've got a right to hate them. And you can keep on hating them if you want to but don't expect the blessings of God. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. You want your bills paid? You better forgive. You want to be healed? You better forgive. You want awesome stuff to happen in your life? You want to do great miracles? You better forgive. You better walk in that forgiveness. There's other things that will stop you from being healed. Going to the wrong church. There's a lot of people, Brother Norval Hayes said that, his mother was a Baptist woman, said she was a, the most praying woman he ever knew in his life. She prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. Every time he looked for her, she was in the bedroom praying. But she died at an early age of a terrible sickness because she did not believe in prayer for miracles. She went to the wrong church. That church taught her that all miracles stopped when the last disciple died. Well, somebody didn't tell the Apostle Paul that because... He wasn't one of the disciples, was he? Somebody didn't tell me that. And a few million other people that go around doing miracles. God is still alive, still in the miracle working business. But his mother did not believe that and she died. So if you go to the wrong church and you're getting wrong information week after week after week, you're being brainwashed with that wrong information. And now it comes time when you need to pray for a miracle of finances. You need to pray for a new job. You need to pray for somebody that really needs serious prayer and you have nothing to give because there's no deposit in you. You've been getting milk toast your whole life. You've been getting the basics your whole life, and now you have no power. Going to the wrong church will kill you. Unbelief of the elder that prays. Now let me tell you something. A lot of churches today don't even have elders. So if you want to go to the elder for them to anoint you with oil, you're in trouble because there's no elders. Now, a lot of churches today have a pastor, and the pastor is doing everything because he wants to. The pastor's praying. The pastor's fixing the roof. Now, if you have to do that, that's one thing. But if you have a church full of people, and you're still trying to do everything, that's wrong. As a leader, we teach leadership conferences in other countries and third world nations. As a leader, you need to learn to delegate authority. The Bible says to seek out those among you of a good reputation, of a good report. And those are the people you need to use. In any church, there are people in there that are just waiting to be used. They're just, they're just ready, but nobody calls on them. God doesn't call those who are qualified. He qualifies those who call, he calls. <clears throat> he does it different than the world does. If God calls you to do something, he'll give you the qualifications you need. 
We had a friend in St. Petersburg, Florida. He still lives down there, Don Villander. When I was in prison, just before I got out, I was a chaplain's assistant. And Don used to come out with a group called the Navigators to do Bible studies at the prison. And he wore these Coke bottle thick glasses. This is before they came out with these new kind of lenses. He had these really, really thick glasses. They weighed about a half a pound. And, uh, I mean, without them glasses, he couldn't see anything. So one night he came out to the prison and I shared my testimony. And he got so excited, he ran back home. And on the way home, he was praying. And he said, Lord, I'll tell you what. I am sick of wearing these glasses. I'm sick of being blind. And as a testimony to my co-workers, I'm taking these glasses off and they're going to see a miracle. If you don't heal my eyes on the way to work tomorrow, I'll have a wreck and die. Well, the next morning, on Monday morning, he got up, he went to work, and he said it was like, it was a beautiful sunny day, beautiful day in Florida, and it was like driving through a thick fog. He was looking through the bottom of the steering wheel and could barely see the road. He said, I could just see that white line because it was sparkling in the sunshine. But other than that, I couldn't see anything. I don't know how I made it to work that day. I prayed in tongues all the way. But he said, I don't know how I made it there, but I made it there. And he said, Lord, you've got to heal my eyes. I'm not putting those glasses back on. The next day, the same thing. The next day, the same thing. He was a supervisor, thank God, so he didn't have to do paperwork or anything. He, he was just there to, to watch people, but he couldn't even see them. So on Saturday, this went on all week long. Couldn't see a thing. But he kept saying, Lord, if you don't heal my eyes, I guess I'm going to get killed out here on the road. I'm not putting them glasses on. You better heal my eyes. On Saturday, he got up. He had a habit every Saturday morning to get up early, and he reads 15 chapters of his Bible. And he got up on Saturday, and he opened his Bible, and he read his 15 chapters, and then he closed the Bible, and then he realized, I just read my Bible. I can't see, but I just read my Bible. He began to look around. He could see everything. His eyes were completely healed. I saw him about five years ago, and his eyes are still healed. He's still walking in health. He's a crotchety old man now, but he's, his eyes are healed. Thank God. Amen. <laughs> Let me tell you something. If you want to see miracles, you've got to align yourself with the Word of God. You've got to put yourself in a place to receive miracles. You've got to repent of your sins. You've got to ask God to forgive you. King David prayed a prayer that I like. He said, Lord, search me and know my heart. If there's any wicked way in me, Anything that's not right, you take it out of me. You know, we have hidden sins, all of us do. We bury things so deep sometimes, hurts, pains, different things. We bury them in our heart, and we think that, that you know, they're not there anymore because we've forgotten about them, but they're still there. You've just covered them up. If you haven't repented of them and released them, they're still there. Ask God to search your heart. Lord, if there's anything in me that doesn't please you, anything that's against the word of God, anything I'm doing that's wrong, anything I should be doing, you let me know right now. And I'm telling you, when you pray that prayer, some of us need to pray it every day because we just let junk pile up on us. I pray that prayer often. Lord, search me. If there's things that, that have gotten into me that, that I didn't know about, that I didn't realize, or I've taken something personal that I should have taken personal, you let me know about it, and I'll repent of it right now. I'm quick to repent. I'll tell you what, if you do something wrong to me, it could be the most wrong thing in the world. You could steal all my money. You could smash my car and laugh at me and drive out of the parking lot. I'll tell you what, I'd still forgive you. I would forgive you. Things are things. They can be replaced. I don't worry about it. We need to learn to let things go like that. The Bible says in the amplified version, when you repent, you need to turn things loose. You need to release them. You need to let them go. Let them drop. Don't keep holding on to things that are hurting you. God wants you blessed and forgiven. Another thing is lack of total commitment, lack of surrender to God. If you're not totally committed to the Lord Jesus Christ, it could stop your healing. It could stop your miracle from coming. And listen, when I'm talking about miracles, I'm talking about prayer. Because without prayer, you can't be healed, right? You've got to say something. You've got to do something. You've got to say something and then demonstrate what you said you do believe. The word believe in the Bible is an action word. Did you know that? In the Greek, it's an action word. It means that I believe it to such an extent that I'm going to show by my actions what I believe. 
And if I don't show by my actions what I believe, I really don't believe it. That's powerful, isn't it? We've got to show God what we believe. You can't just say, oh, I believe, I believe, I believe. I believe in miracles. I, I believe God's blessing me. I, I believe I'm going to have money this week. I believe I'm going to have a better job. But if you don't put any action to it, if you don't step out in faith and say, God, I believe you're doing it today. I believe by Monday I'm going to see a turnaround. Well, what if it don't happen Monday? Then you say, God, I believe by Tuesday I'm going to see a turnaround. It didn't happen today, but I still believe you. I'm still standing on the word. I'm not going to change. I know you're going to do it. Maybe I got the timing wrong, but I know your will. Your will is to bless me. Third John 2 says, Beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. It's his will that you be in health. It's his will that you prosper. Do you know the biblical word for prosper? The literal translation of that means to do better than you've ever done before. Now, think of, I was thinking about that one day. If God prospers me today, I'm going to do better today than I've ever done in my life. But then tomorrow comes. If God prospers me tomorrow, I'm going to do better tomorrow than I've ever done in my whole life. It gets gooder and gooder. I mean, day by day, it just, God just piles it on more and more and more. He doesn't run out of blessings, so why do we want to stop asking him? Let's just keep on going. God wants to prosper you. He wants to bless you. You've got to line up with his will. Say, God, you can prosper me. Today, you can prosper me all you want. You can wake me up at 3 in the morning if you want to prosper me. I'm ready for it. Just give it to me. Bless me with it, Lord. Give me wisdom. Give me understanding. Help me to know how to operate these gifts you've given me. Help me to know how to walk into this calling that you have on my life, how to walk in this ministry that you have chosen for me. I don't know a thing about it. Show me what to do. You see, the reason God called me when I first got out of prison to preach the gospel around the world, I'd already been preaching the gospel in prison. When I got healed in prison on March 10th of 1979, all those sicknesses and diseases and paralysis and brain damage left me instantly. A revival broke out in that prison. That prison chapel was packed out every week. And I began teaching and training other inmates how to go out on a prison compound and lay hands on the sick and cast out demons, how to heal the sick, how to raise the dead, how to lead people to Jesus. And that prison was on fire. Then I get a letter in the mail saying, we take, we've cut your sentence in half by 15 years for no reason. I got another letter saying, oh, we made a mistake. We've taken more years off your sentence. You see, I was busy doing what God wanted me to do. I wasn't worried about my prison sentence. You know, you need to grow where you're planted. You don't like where you're at right now? Do the best you can right there, but keep looking beyond that. Keep your sights high. Keep your vision going. Don't let the devil steal your vision from you. And then I got another letter from the state of Florida a few months later, and he said, uh, this guy said, when I go out to that prison, I see all these miracles happen. He said, I'm a Baptist. We don't believe that stuff. But I'm seeing prison guards giving me testimonies that they were sick, they were dying, they were in pain, and some inmate prayed for them, and they got healed. And every time I check out these crazy stories, somehow you're involved with it. And he said, I've never done this in my 30-year career with the prison system, but I talked to the head man about you yesterday, and today there's a note here saying you go home in two weeks. So because God had me focused on ministry in the prison, had me focused on leading people to Christ, had me focused on miracles, he used that later on to touch somebody's heart that didn't even believe in that to have me released from prison. I was supposed to be there a minimum of 23 and a half years. I was released in six years and two months. God has a vision for all of you. He wants you to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Get these tracks back there and read them. They're awesome. If you need more of these, you can write me. Send us an email and we'll send you more of them. We just started reproducing these so that people would know about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It gives you scriptures on there about uh, questions people have about it, discussions, lots of scriptures, lots of scriptures. What is it for? How to receive it? What's this new language? Why do I need it? So many things on here. Word of knowledge, gift of faith, the different gifts, what they are. 
You need to get those back and read them. I want you to realize, while I've been speaking tonight, God's been doing miracles in this place. Some of you haven't realized it yet. Somebody's right knee was healed. You had a pain in your knee. Begin to move that knee right now. God is doing miracles in this place. Somebody's lower back is being healed right now. My lower back is burning. Somebody's lower back is being healed. You had a pain in your back, a stiffness. If you begin to move that now, test it out. Check it out. God is healing some people's eyes in here tonight. He's changing your prescription, your eye prescription. I was in a meeting in Thomaston, Georgia, full gospel businessmen meeting at a restaurant. And I said, there are seven women here tonight that wear glasses. God is changing your prescription, and you will not be able to see out of your glasses tonight. After the meeting, seven women brought me their glasses. One lady, I knew her, this little black lady, she was on welfare. I said, oh, praise God, God healed your eyes. She goes, honey, I can read that sign across the parking lot in the dark, and I didn't even know there was a sign there before the meeting started. And I can see it clearly now in the dark. She called me two weeks later. She said, uh, uh, Brother Ricky, I need prayer. And I said, well, your eyes are still healed. Oh, yeah, my eyes are fine. They're great. She said, but I've been living in government housing, and now I don't qualify because I'm not legally blind, and they're throwing me out. So I prayed for her on the phone, and two days later, a lady invited her into her house to stay there, gave her a room to stay, gave her her own bathroom, her own part of the house, and hired her for her business. You see, God's not going to do a miracle for you to put you in another bad situation. He's going to take care of you. Who had their back healed? Who had a pain in their back and it's gone now? Let me see your hand. Move your back around. It was on this side, on the right side. Thank you, Jesus. Miracles are happening in this room right now. Right now. Right now. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody had an upset stomach when you came in tonight. You just, this seems kind of minor, but somebody had an upset stomach and your stomach is fine right now. Check it out. Is that you? You feel good? Amen. Amen. God is doing lots of miracles here. You know, we say upset stomach, but I mean, it could be an ulcer. It could be a cancer. Who knows? But God has healed it. Amen? A lot of things upset your stomach. Praise God. Somebody had a pain right in the back of your head, right in the base of your neck. You had a pain, kind of a soreness right there. Check it out right now. Move your head around. That pain is gone. There's several people in this place receiving miracles. Check your body out right now. If you came in tonight and you had limitations on moving something, on bending something, move it around now. Check it out. Check it out. If your arm was hurting, swing it around. Move it around. If you couldn't stretch, if you couldn't bend, if you couldn't shake your head without being dizzy, do it. Check it out. How many had a problem when you came in and it's gone now? Let me see your hand. (coughs) Over here. Amen. Amen. Several things are happening in here. Praise God. I want you to know tonight, <clears throat> Mike, can I get some water? Can I get some water? I want you to know, know tonight that God is on your side. God's not against you in any way. Some people have been taught that, that, that God is up there with a big stick just waiting for us to make a mistake so he can swat us with a stick. That's not God. That's not the God I know. The God I know doesn't kill babies and blow up buses like the Muslims do. Allah is not God. Let me tell you that right now. I have, every year we see thousands and thousands of Muslims come to Jesus in third world countries, some in the United States. Thank you. I tell you what, when a Muslim's baby gets healed by Jesus, they forget about Allah real quick. I was in a village preaching out in the jungle in Congo, and the village leader was a Muslim, a great big tall man. And I said to him, how long have you been a Muslim? He said, I've been a Muslim now for 36 years. And I said, so if you're a devout Muslim, I knew he wasn't. But I said, if you're a devout Muslim, you roll out your red carpet facing toward Mecca, and five times a day you bow and you pray and you say the same chant over and over five times a day. Is that correct? He said, yeah. I said, now let me ask you a question. In 36 years... Has Allah ever answered you? He had to think about that. And then he said, no. I said, in 36 years, has Allah ever come to your village and just blessed your crops 
I mean, your farms just produce such an abundance, you didn't know what to do with it. He said, never. Some years we have a drought and dozens of people die. But we never have enough. We're always suffering. I said, let me ask you one more question. If you go to another village and you knock on your friend's door and you call his name and you call his name and you call his name and he doesn't answer, he's not home. I said, for 36 years you've been calling Allah and he's not home. He's never answered you. He's never helped you. He's never done anything for you. Why do you want to serve him? I said, I've been in your village for 20 minutes now and 19 people were healed by the Lord and miraculous things, crippled boys walking. Your own sister was healed of a disease that she'd had all her life. God healed her. I said, which God do you want to serve? I said, there's only one. He said, I want you to come to my church, come to my village and start a church, and I'm going to be a member of your church. I said, well, what about Allah? He said, forget about him. <laughs> you see, when the rubber meets the road, people make the right choice. When I go into the village, the first thing I ask them, I go into remote areas in, in Muslim countries, in Hindu countries. I go into communist areas where we're not supposed to be. Our own State Department warns us against going to these places. We go there. And when I go there, the first thing I do is I ask the village leader, do you have any sick people here? Oh, yeah, lots of sick people. I'm sick myself. I said, good, call all of them out here. Well, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to pray for them in the name of Jesus, and he's going to heal them. They look at you like you're crazy, like you just fell off the back of the watermelon truck or something. You know, Where'd this guy come from? But they call him out there. And when they call him out there, I pray for him. Just a simple prayer of faith. And God does great miracles. We've seen every kind of thing happen. Just tremendous miracles happen. And then I tell the village leader, I said, listen, there's only one God that made the heavens and the earth. And there's only one God that answers prayer. And if you don't serve that God, you'll die in your sins and you will not go to heaven. Most of the time, they repent. One village leader got saved and he was so excited after we left there, he went to the other four villages in their area and he evangelized them. Just got saved the day before. And, and within a few weeks, they had five villages that were born again of Muslims. And I told the chief, I said, listen, you just accepted Jesus today, but you can go to the next village and you can lay hands on the sick. You can cast out demons. You're a believer now. I don't know if he did, but I know he got him saved. Amen? I want you to stand up on your feet for just a moment. Stand up on your feet. Check your body out. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is good. For these CDs back there, we're only asking $5. A lot of people sell their CDs for 10 or 15 bucks. $5. They make good Christmas gifts, Hanukkah, Bar Mitzvah, you know, birthday gifts. You can give them to all your heathen friends, your relatives. Buy a bunch of these things. I don't want to take these things home. They're too heavy to carry in my suitcase. Amen? So buy them CDs. There's a little box back there. Just leave your money in it. If you write a check, just make it out to RLM. Ricky Leonard Ministries. RLM is all you need to put on there. The bank will take care of it. Amen? Amen? If you need to know how to spell thousand or million, let me know. We'll, we'll tell you. We'll help you. God wants to do good things tonight in this place. If you're here tonight and you've never received Jesus, you've never been born again, you've never asked Jesus into your life, if that's you, I'd like to pray for you right now. If you're here tonight, Anybody at all that's never received Jesus? All right. If you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, I want to pray for you tonight. You need that power. Because without that power, you will fail. Believe me, you'll fail. You can't make it. If it was good enough for Jesus, if it was good enough for the disciples, if it was good enough for Paul... And anybody else that's been in ministry that's done anything for God in a big way, you need it. If you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit tonight, come up here. It's just a simple prayer. It's a gift that God wants to give you. Come on, brother. Just stand right there. Anybody else? 
You know, when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's kind of like, kind of like swimming in water that's a little bit cool in the summertime. If you put your toe in it, you'll never get in. You just got to jump in, and then you see that it's all right. When you receive the Holy Spirit, just jump in. Just 